I want to invite everyone to turn to uh, Revelation chapter 3 this morning. And uh, I'm grateful to God for Eric. Um, Last week, he just did a fine job, didn't he, Um, expounding a very difficult passage and uh, walking through it with pastoral care and sensitivity and honoring God um, by accurately explaining it. And uh, we were so well served by it. And in just discipleship group uh, Wednesday night at our house, um, there were so many good discussion points of how what we heard on Sunday really applies to where we're at. So um, I'm thankful for him and for his faithfulness to study and prepare God's word. Um, As we come to the next section, so we're, we're moving through the book of Revelation verse by verse. We believe in expository preaching and going verse by verse. And the next section is a letter to the church in Philadelphia. And so this, this letter, this section really of uh, six verses is very different than the previous six verses that we heard last week. So the church at Sardis last week we saw was rebuked for their deadness. They were called to repentance. But you'll see here the church at Philadelphia is commended and encouraged to hold fast. So by the Holy Spirit's design, when you think about reading through a book of the Bible, readers of this book of Revelation would be reading it like we are, just going right down the verse by verse. They didn't have verse numbers, but they're following the same order that that we are. And so as they're reading this, as the early church is reading this, they would feel the sting of the first six verses, as well as the healing balm of the next six verses that we're going to see today. And so it's just such a a fitting way uh, to follow up from last week. So kind of the Lord to give it to us in this particular order. That is no accident. The way scripture is ordered is designed and inspired by God for a particular purpose. So let's receive God's word together as we read this. And as we've been doing, I'm going to begin actually in chapter 1. We'll read verses 12 to 20. And then we'll jump to chapter 3 and read our passage for this morning. So to set the stage for this morning, Revelation 1, 12 to 20. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his face was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death in Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you've seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we're turning to the sixth lampstand, chapter 3, verse 7, to the church in Philadelphia. Right. The, excuse me, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they're Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come down and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, I pray that you would 
Bless the preaching of your word for our good, for our edification, comfort, encouragement, exhortation, that the body of Christ and our church would be built up as a result of the unfolding of your word, which brings light to our hearts and eyes. We invite you to do that. We posture our hearts to receive and to be changed by what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, have you ever asked the question and just wondered about your own life, is what I'm doing, whatever it may be, worth it? It doesn't feel like whatever I'm doing is making much of a difference. Um, and from a practical standpoint, usually that leads to, well, maybe we need to change our approach or something. I'm a small business owner and kind of lately have been more living on, in the business side of, of things in the work world. And, you know, in business, both as a small business owner as well as my 18 years in healthcare, and we, we talk about KPIs, key performance indicators, right? How do we know if what we're doing works and is successful? And what do we need to change to meet certain criteria, certain metrics? Well, that's fine for business. That's probably smart when it comes to the work world. But in God's economy, things are very different. Does he measure success by outward, visible, measurable results? Or does he look at the heart? Is he more concerned with faithfulness or with fruitfulness? This church in Philadelphia, he tells them, you have but little power, <laughs> which I think means they're not impressive by human terms. The church growth experts would come and do an audit of their programs and everything that they're doing, and they would say, you know, they're not really meeting the key performance criteria, the key performance indicators for the organization. Um, but Jesus comes and evaluates them. He's using an entirely different metric, isn't he? While fruit and results certainly are important to Jesus, they are, he doesn't call us to mass produce them or to force them out of us. Instead, he calls us to faithfully keep the word and leave the results up to him. That's the message to this Philadelphia church. You focus on the word, cling to it like your life depends on it because it does, and he will take care of the rest. He's got you, and he's got this church. But you know, that truth, I think, is deeper than we often realize. It's a simple truth. But have we really pondered the depth of its implications? That's what I want to do together this morning. So the main point is that, very simply, those who keep the word will be kept by Jesus. This is encouraging. Our call is not to be great. It's not to be impressive or to be famous. Our call is to be faithful. And so this church in Philadelphia may have been weak and unimpressive by some standards, but they are commended by God because they are faithful. They kept the word, and they didn't deny Jesus when the heat was turned up. And Jesus knows, we see in the passage, that eventually he's warning them more persecution is in fact coming. And so what is Jesus saying to a church, to, to a weak church, who's about to face some rough waters? How does he address this church? What is Jesus' posture towards a weak church who's in a context where things are probably going to get very tough? Persecution is going to ramp up. Restrictions are going to tighten. The gatherings that they took for granted are suddenly going to become an issue, possibly illegal. How does Jesus address these people? He promises them that as they hold fast to the word, he will be holding fast to them because those who keep the word will be kept by Jesus. Now let's look at how that's so. First point, Jesus is the holy and true doorkeeper. If you look at verse 7, Jesus makes it clear that these are the words of a certain someone. Now all these descriptors are not just throwaway, introductory, cute font stuff at the beginning of the letter. No, th this description of Jesus is key. He is the Holy One, which is to say he is unique. He is set apart. He is, in contrast to these seven churches, holy and perfect and pure. In a way, categorically, that the people were not. He is righteous in all his ways. He is the Holy One. And it's his words, the, the words of the Holy One, that matter. Next, he is the true one. Just think about this. He's not fake. He has no substitute. He's not just the embodiment of truth. 
in, in that he does not merely contain truth in the words he speaks. He's at least that, but he's more than that. He is the very definition of truth and authenticity. He is not a fake or a hypocrite like some of the people that, in the churches that he rebukes in this book. He is the real deal through and through. And interestingly, ironically, however you look at it, we, we live in what, what some have called the age of authenticity, a way to describe the modern times where being your authentic self becomes the idol that we bow down to, that we give our all to, that we sacrifice anything for. This is a, a theme through multiple movies and music. If you pay attention to messages and lyrics, this is the undercurrent that runs through everything. The truly fulfilled and liberated person is the one who can express his or her authentic self. And in fact, the height of bondage is succumbing to all of the rules and limitations that society and religion and other authorities place upon you. That, that's the, the value, the idea that we're being sold, isn't it? As with all of Satan's lies, there is truth mixed in with that error. It is true that we are unique, that each of us is designed by God with unique abilities and qualities and traits. But it's also true that sin has twisted and corrupted and distorted that. And only in Christ can God's purposes and designs for us be ultimately realized in the highest, most God-glorifying, most joy-producing sense. But that is not society's definition of authenticity, is it? No. Society looks at everything the Bible calls fallen and sinful and God-rejecting and says, therein lies your authentic self. And so fallenness is not something to be repented of and turned from and re redeemed and changed and redefined and made new. But instead, sinfulness is meant to be embraced so that what the Bible calls evil, you would come to see as actually good. It's very deceptive. But only by redefining the terms can you really liberate yourself from enough to discover your so-called authentic self. That is the age of authenticity that we live in. Jesus speaks right into this, into this lie and into this deception, and he says he is the only true, authentic one. Our lives will only make sense as we're swept up into his story, and we find our story in his, and we map our identity onto his identity, a new identity that he gives us that's based on who he is and what he says about us not defined by the sinful cravings and distortions of our own flesh. Only he is perfectly holy and perfectly true. And we will not see ourselves rightly until we see him rightly as the holy and true one. How do we do that? Well, it says here he's the holy and true doorkeeper. He holds the key. And what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. It says he has the key of David and has full control over the door. This is a reference to Isaiah 22, 22. In your notes, I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. So Jesus, by quoting this verse about himself, he's saying that he is the fulfillment of that prophecy given some 700 years beforehand. Now, really, sometimes in the, open, in, in the New Testament, an open door refers to gospel opportunity and evangelistic efforts. But here, it seems that the key to the house of David and the door that leads into it seems to be a metaphor for access into the new family of God, really. So, it's life under this new covenant, access through a particular door. So, there are those on the outside of the door addressed in verse 9, and those who are on the inside. And who grants inside access? Well, it's the one standing at the door, guarding it, and holding the key, which is Jesus. So he has authority, and access is granted on his terms. And as the holy, true key holder, doorkeeper, what does that mean for us? Well, first, it means he is the only way in. This is what we see in the phrase, what he opens, no one can shut. The only way in 
is Jesus. That's the only way. Of course, Jesus himself said this. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. Even in John, in John chapter 10, he even actually warns that some people will try to climb in by some other way. But he is the only way in. And we realize that by saying Jesus is the only way, by teaching, preaching, proclaiming, talking about the exclusivity of Christ as the only way to God, that we will be rejected for saying that. We may be called narrow-minded or bigoted or oppressive. But as Al Mohler so aptly titled a sermon he preached years ago at Together for the Gospel, he said, the only door is an open door. Such a great phrase. Yes, Jesus holds the keys to the door. He is the only door, but the only door is wide open, and whosoever may come can come into this door. Verse 8, he sets the door before us, which no one is able to shut. By extension, the church is, is given this idea of the door as well. We are extensions of Jesus. Remember, Jesus handed the keys to Peter, metaphorically speaking, to say, you, you are the living expression of the gospel that calls sinners into the family through the door who is Jesus. So it's a reminder of the church's evangelistic missional calling. I love the old song that says, to God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Some of you may remember that song. Open the life gate that all may come. Picture of Jesus as the door, op the only door, but an open door. And I'm, it just reminds me of LifeGate Church in Seguin. I'm so thankful for them, our sister church in Seguin, Texas, who named itself after the phrase in that song, the LifeGate, as an expression of its commitment to be an evangelistic church, to be the kind of church Jesus is talking about that serves as an extension of and living expression of Christ standing at the open door calling people to enter in. They, they have an historic commitment to evangelism most recently evidenced by sending Philip Estrada to plant a church in San Antonio. So if that's true, if that Jesus is the only way, the holy and true doorkeeper, how does that show up in our own lives? How does it show up in our corporate life as a church? Maybe it's repeatedly sharing the gospel with your children, participating in the quarterly neighborhood outreaches that we just uh, are, are getting a, a new plan and, and intentionality with sharing the gospel with others there's so many ways that when we really realize that Jesus is the only way that truth has got to show up in some extension of that truth to those who are looking for way a way to God looking for peace looking for happiness looking for forgiveness looking for atonement and everything else but Jesus we hold the key because we hold Christ and so Jesus is the only way. May we point people to him. May it never just be a truth that's on a page, but may we keep looking to him and pointing to him. Not only is he the only way, point two, or sub point two, once he brings you in to through the door, you are safe and secure from the enemy. That's what's meant by the phrase, what he shuts, no one can open. For the Christian, this is assurance that when he brings you in, he shuts the door behind you. Amen. No one can take you out. Jesus, also in John chapter 10, talk, talked about, my father is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. All that the father has given me are mine and will come. And my father is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. So it's another way to say that when Jesus closes the door, ain't no one opening it. The enemy's not getting in there. He can't mess with you because Jesus lets people in, and he's not letting them in. That's the picture there. This is not a revolving door that goes round and round and people are just coming in and out. No, the kingdom of heaven is not pictured that way. As the doorkeeper, Jesus is keeping, guarding, protecting, sustaining, and preserving his people. Now, for the person who has not trusted in Jesus, who's not turned from their sin and placed their faith in Jesus, here's what these two points mean for you. The door is open. What are you waiting for? How do I know it's open? Because you're hearing this message right now. Jesus is calling you to himself. Look at 
verse 8. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door. Just think about that. Young person, teenager, what are you waiting for? Turn from sin. Turn to Jesus. Don't assume you have another day. Don't think you can wait until you're older and live your life a little bit before you come to Jesus. No, now is the day. The door is open now. You're hearing the gospel now. Don't delay another moment. Older person, adult, whatever, whatever age you're at, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting to clean up your act before coming to Jesus first? Are you ashamed of your past and you think that you need to fix a few things before you come to Jesus? No, that's why you come. You're bringing him your mess. You're bringing him your sin, your shame, your failings, so that he can do something about it. He's the only one who can do something about it. The door is open now. And at some point, the door will close, and it will be too late. That's not to say one day you'll be begging for Jesus to save you, and he'll be saying, it's too late, you can't come in. It's not like, that's not the picture the Bible portrays, except for those who are in hell. And even then, they're begging, and Jesus is telling them, it's too late, you had your chance. And they're, they become evangelistic in hell. Can you at least send someone to go tell my friends and my neighbors and my relatives? That, to tell them, please, it, it, just tell them. Maybe if somebody comes back from the dead, they'll believe. And Jesus, remember, said, even if somebody comes back from the dead, it takes more than just a, a miracle like that. It takes at least that, but it's... That in itself is not persuasive enough. The time is now. The time is now to decide. It, it will, the, the day will come when the door will indeed close. Jesus is now is calling, inviting, beckoning you to come. Don't wait another moment. And guess what? Because he's the holy one and true one, it means he sees all, he knows all. You bring him your mess. Bring him your hypocrisy. Bring him your self-righteousness. Lay it all at his feet. Confess your sin and cast yourself on his mercy. That's what it means to get real with Jesus. Maybe, maybe for some of us for the first time. This is the true and holy one who stands at the door, key in hand, eager to receive sinners in their weakness. This is the Jesus who promises to keep his people as they Keep his word. Point two, those who keep his word will be kept in tribulation. Those who keep his word will be kept in tribulation. We see this in the second half of verse 8, right into verse 11. The first, second half of verse 8 begins with Jesus acknowledging that this church is weak. I know that you have but little power. But he commends them. He says, I know your works, but you've kept my word. You've not denied my name. They may have but little power. They're not impressive by human standards, but that doesn't affect their faithfulness. What were they faithful to do? They were faithful to keep the word of Jesus. More specifically, in verse 10, you can see what, what word he's referring to. They've kept the word of patient endurance. And so they are, in verse 11, to hold fast to that, to hold fast what you have, which is this word that you have received and have kept. Hang on to it, he's saying. So the first... Part of this section is just encouragement. Encouragement for keeping the word. Just reflect on your own life. You may have a thousand sin struggles. But where have you kept the word? Be encouraged. If you've kept the word, you've kept the word. Jesus did something in you to enable you, to empower you to keep the word. Be encouraged by that. You may be more aware of ways you're turning to other things in some areas. And you should bring that to Jesus, yes? But can you find any evidences of God's grace in your life? Anything at all? If you can, be encouraged. You're keeping the word. Do you hate some sin more than you used to? Are you quicker to reconcile with your spouse than you used to be? Do you read your Bible more frequently than you did in the past? Be encouraged. You are keeping the word. You may feel pressure to compromise at work or in school, to bend or twist truth to fit in, to give in to sin so people won't think you're weird. Where has God helped you, though, to keep the word? 
Has he helped you to keep the word somewhere? To stand strong and remain faithful to him at some point in some area of your life? If he has, acknowledge that and be encouraged. You have kept the word and remained faithful. And God notices that and he commends you just as he commended this church. So notice the flow of thought here. You have but little power, but you've kept the word. And so... I will do these powerful things. So we move from encouragement to this assurance of future vindication in verse 9. Verse 9, he says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. That's What is he talking about there? The point here is that he will vindicate your name and witness before his enemies. Verse 9 addresses this group who claim to be Jews but are actually of the synagogue of Satan. Now this group has been addressed prior in the book and here it comes up a second time. But to say it that way, man, you, you can't state it any more clearly than that. Apparently this was a group of people who thought that by mere involvement in and time around the expressions of religion that they are God's special people. But Jesus' stinging words here make the point that, no, inclusion in the covenant people of God is no longer defined along physical terms. It's not defined that way. Outward markers and ethnicity and things like that, all of those things were pointing to an ultimate reality, which is that God's people would come to be marked and defined by Jesus himself. It was pointing ahead to that reality. Jesus arrives on the sin scene. He atones for sin on the cross and that positions him as the one true only holy doorkeeper who holds the keys. That's the picture here. To trust in anything else, to expect to climb in some other way is actually an affront to the death of Jesus on the cross. That's why he describes these people in such stark contrast to those who have kept his word and remained faithful to his name. He describes them as the synagogue of Satan. Because trusting in anything else other than Jesus is that level of affront to his atoning work. Jesus assures and promises this weak church, though, that one day these enemies will humbly acknowledge that these Christians are the ones that God has covenantally loved. Verse 9, he says, I will make them come and bow down before your feet. Well, we know from Philippians 2.10 that one day every knee will bow and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, joyfully or regretfully, but everyone will bow the knee one day. So that's part of what Jesus is referring to. But here specifically, they will learn learn that I have loved you. That's the idea there. you, You have loved who? Remember, Jewish identity at this time had turned into an issue of racial and uh, spiritual superiority. Whole careers were built around being God's chosen people. So these folks assumed they were fine. But if they were not trusting in Jesus, Jesus' evaluation is that you're actually of the synagogue of Satan. And one day, along with everyone else who trusts in anything other than Jesus, they will come to realize that Jesus has set his covenantal love on those who trust in him, not those who trust only in in their Judaism. God will vindicate his people before their enemies. Third, there's this promise that they will be kept by Jesus in verses 10 and 11. So it keeps getting better, right? We just keep reading, it gets better because the assurance of vindication is followed by this promise in verse 10 and 11 where Jesus promises them that because they have kept the word about patient endurance, he will keep them in future trials and tribulations. Now, If you squint hard enough at that verse, you could almost say it's a verse about a rapture. But there's not anything here that really suggests that the way he keeps them is by extracting them entirely from the world. But rather he promises his people that trial is on its way. But if you keep his word, you will conquer. After all, it's not just any word that you're keeping. It's the word about patient endurance. So the picture is not extraction from persecution, but a special guarding or keeping during persecution. That is, despite suffering and persecution that you will actually experience, you will remain strong in your faith and you will patiently endure. Now, we love those who have a different view. I'm just articulating a nuance that that we would share here um, 
and respectfully disagree with those who, who take that verse a different way. The evidence seems to weigh more heavily in favor of the fact that these believers will endure tribulation and God will keep them in the tribulation and protect them and preserve them from it so that it doesn't ultimately ruin them and tank them and sink their ship. That's what it's referring to. So it's not a promise, I don't think, about a rapture. I think it's something much better than that. It's a promise that God will sustain you through the hardest time and through the fiercest opposition. That as you work to keep his word, he is working even harder to keep you. He will take what feels to you like mere human effort and hard work, reading your Bible, getting up early, telling your kids the gospel like for the millionth time, and everything else that comes along with, with normal life. Coming to church, showing up, reconciling when there's conflict, clinging to truth even when it costs you something. And he will take those efforts and infuse them with a supernatural impact so that the end result is nothing short of a miracle. The endurance of your faith. That's what he's after. So in light of this encouragement that you have kept his word, this assurance that he will vindicate your name before his enemies, this promise to keep you through the hardest of times, verse 11 presents our first and only action item in this whole section. The only command in this whole set of six verses. Hold fast to what you have. His word, which they have kept. But he's telling them now, hold fast to it, that no one may take away your future reward. To, that no one may seize your crown, is the phrase that's used there. This reality, this command means that the reality is it's possible to not hold fast. It's possible to lose our grip on the word rather than hold fast to it and thus forfeit future reward. Seems to me that the door he sets before them in verse 8, if you walk through it, he's saying you'll stay centered on the word. You'll come into the fullness of love, endure coming trials, receive a reward. Those who keep the word will be kept in times of tribulation because as you keep the word, he is keeping you. So hold fast to it. It's all surrounded by these promises and assurances. And in light of that, he says, no, hold fast to it. Grab it tightly. Don't relax your grip because he is holding fast to you. Which brings us to our third point. Those who are kept by Jesus belong to Jesus forever. It's really a point about belonging is these, these verses here. As we come into verse 12, the metaphor changes a little bit from a person looking at an open door, being invited to come in. The metaphor changes as he talks about holding fast to one who conquers. And so it's more of a metaphor of a warrior in battle who has gripped his sword so tightly that he couldn't let it go, and he came out victorious in the struggle. Now, if you've ever gripped something tightly for a long time, you know your hand kind of fuses to it. Like a, you're doing a work project, and you're using a cordless drill the whole time and everything, and then you go to set the drill down and, and your hand's like this. That's happened to me. Like, I can't straighten anything out. It's like I'm still holding it in my hand. Like, everything's stuck. That's the picture. This guy is gripping this thing so tight because he's in a life-death situation. And he's holding fast to it. And because he's holding fast to it, Jesus is holding fast to him, enabling him to conquer. And he conquers and he comes out victorious. For that person who held fast to the word and thus conquered, he, he says here, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. This is a contrast again to the falsely assured people of verse 9 which continues into verse 12 and 13. These believers, rather than having to stand outside the temple as outsiders to God's covenant promises, these believers who do this will be made pillars in the new temple, which is constructed on the basis of clinging to Jesus, not clinging to other things. And this relationship that Jesus establishes with them is permanent, it's everlasting. It tells him they, they are eternally secure in verse 12. Never shall he go out of it. The God, the, the people that God saves, God keeps. Amen. He doesn't save part way. He saves to the uttermost. His redemption never fails to achieve its full effect. 
Should someone abandon the faith and walk away from Jesus permanently? First of all, remember, Jesus told us this was going to happen. Second, in taking the teaching of the entire New Testament, we understand that that only proves that that person never belonged to Jesus to begin with. Regenerated people produce fruit and and endure to the end. Those who are regenerated by the Spirit of God, it is such a miracle of regeneration that there is no going back. They come into the door, and yes, they struggle, and yes, they're weak. We feel that ourselves, don't we? But there's something in our hearts that says, I don't want to leave because God's given us a new heart, a new desire. And they're safe and secure for all eternity. It says, verse 12, never shall he go out of it. They are kept by Jesus for all eternity. What a comforting truth that is. They're not just kept for all eternity. They belong to Jesus. Look at this this phrase. I will write on him the name of my God. And then later, and my own new name. In other words, they are given a new identity. I want this point to just land home on us. I think the, the Spirit would want to drive this deep into our hearts. Because in the human search to understand ourselves and discover who we are, Jesus comes in and defines us. He grants a new identity. He says, you belong to Jesus. Young people especially, oh, please get this. Where have you felt rejected? Like you don't belong, like you don't fit in, or like you're on the outside. You know, everyone talks about wanting to stand out and be unique and be special, but on the other hand, there's this pressure and desire that we all feel to fit in, to be liked, to be accepted. And one of our deepest fears, especially in our younger years, is being rejected. For some, this means putting a ton of time and effort into a, 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 into a certain public image. I want people to like me. I want people to think I'm a certain way because if they do, they will accept me and I will be loved and I'll be popular. You might not say that with your mouth, but often that's what's driving our hearts. The last thing you want is to be ignored and to be forgotten and unknown. For others, this fear of, reject- <clears throat> of rejection <clears throat> is basically a fear that you will be known. What if people find out who I really am and what I'm really like? Surely they will reject me then. They will make fun of me. They'll mock me. So the solution may not be to just put yourself forward and try to impress people. That would be the struggle of some. But the struggle of others may be to pull back, to stay in the shadows, to hide, to build walls, avoid conversations. Escape into video games or habits or hobbies because you feel safe there. But whether it's running towards people so you can be known or running away from people so you won't be known, Jesus stops you and he says, I know you. I know you. And if you come to me and enter my door, I will give you a new name and a new identity. You will know me and you will be known by me. And you You will finally belong. You will finally belong. This is what it means to be kept by Jesus. You belong. You belong to him forever. He loves you. This 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 part of this just affects me because this is how I got saved. The preaching of the word. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world, becomes an enemy of God, gripped my heart, pierced me deeply when I was 10 years old. And it brought up this question of belong. Who will I belong to? Will I be a friend of the world and an enemy of God? Do I want to be God's enemy? Remember Pastor Peter preaching on Hebrews, Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than endure the pleasures of sin for a short time. Jesus grants belonging that nothing in this world can replace. They belong to Jesus. I will write on him the name of my God, my own new name. 
Don't look to anything else. Look to Jesus. And thirdly, they are given a new home. He will write on them the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. We sing a song that says, our rest is in heaven, our rest is not here. Why should we tremble when trials draw near? See, we're given a new name and identity, and we are given a new home. That means we'll never find rest and safety in anything this world has to offer. We have a new destination. And one day, we'll gather around the throne of Jesus in the new Jerusalem. And our eyes will be fully open to these realities. So, question. Would he want to open your eyes to these realities now? Maybe just a little bit? Yeah, for sure. He wants to open our eyes to these realities. So we sing a song. When we see your face, we we will see, we will know, like we've never known before, we'll be found, we'll be home, we'll be yours forevermore. Such sweet words. Sorry, I'm just on a song kick. And then I think, is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. It is good that we remind ourselves of this. As Christians, when we remind ourselves of this, our lives get reoriented around this new identity. We are eternally secure. We belong to Jesus. We have a new home. See, the constant temptations to be chasing after other, other joys, chasing after other things, thinking that our greatest joy, our greatest comfort, our greatest satisfaction, our greatest sense of belonging can be found in the here and now that this world has to offer. That's not true. But listen, I'm not saying don't chase joy, comfort, satisfaction, sense of belonging, and all those things. I'm saying that you'll only find that in Jesus. Chase it. That's why your heart's longing for it. But let the chase bring you right to Jesus. The door is open. He stands there with the key, arms wide opening, saying, no, come to me. Don't drink from the polluted cisterns of this world that hold no water. Come to me. He will secure you for all eternity. You can belong to him. You can have a home that no one can take away despite persecution, despite opposition, because those who keep that word belong to Jesus because he keeps them for all eternity. So, wrap this up. Do you feel weak? Do you feel insignificant? Do you feel like what you're doing doesn't matter, doesn't make a difference? You need the encouragement that this truth offers this morning. Are you ready to give up? Well, let the Lord pastor you in these verses. And here are a few ways that this truth should impact us. It should give us confidence that keeping the word will be worth it. So what can you do this week to ensure... That you're holding fast to the word. That you're keeping the word. There's lots of ways we can be intentional to do that. Another thing it should do, it should cause us to draw near to him with honesty. Knowing that he is keeping us. You don't have to try to impress him. He sees all. He knows all. He holds us in his hands already. So as you remove your mask and lay aside the image that you're trying to keep up in front of other people. You will let the truth of his love reach to the deepest parts of who you are. And you will find security in his love for you. You will increasingly be comforted and wonderfully freed by the reality that you do belong. And you don't have to hide. Ray Ortland says, the gospel gives us reason to draw the curtain back. Show God everything. Confess every detail. And listen to this phrase. Just just think about this. Let's trust him that much and open our hearts to his redemptive love. See, not getting honest before God is, is really what Ortland is implying is a distrust of God. I don't trust you, God, with the fine china of my life. I'm afraid you'll drop it and break it and I'll be wounded and hurt again. So I can't bring you the deepest pains of my life, the deepest sorrows. But no, let's trust him that much. He holds us. He redefines us. And then Orland goes on, this is how he saves sinners. How could it be otherwise? God redeems the dirty, the unwashed, the unworthy, and no one else. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I haven't come for the healthy. They don't need the doctor. Jesus redeems the dirty, the unwashed, the unworthy, and no one else. And praise God that he does. This truth should build our anticipation for the future, finally, that as the world grows darker and evil abounds, and God's people are persecuted, we have something to look forward to. 
As the old song says, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Yes, do you long for that day? Is there a growing desire for heaven in your heart? Is that day a day of rejoicing and singing and shouting the victory? See, I think the the eschatological hope of the Christian is a functionally neglected truth for many of us. May it not be so. May we think of the future hope that Jesus has laid out before us and assured us of, and may that infuse faith in our hearts. May it build us up now. May it sustain us for the everyday struggles and trials of this life. May we meditate on this reality. And may our hearts be stirred and encouraged by it and our faith built up because of it. Because those who keep his word will be kept by Jesus for all eternity. Isn't that encouraging? Let's stand together. Jesus, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for this wonderful encouragement that you bring to this weak, otherwise unimpressive church. And you reorient that church even as we invite you to reorient us in our reading of it so Lord have your way in our hearts show us where we need to repent show us where we need to look to you to just maybe it's looking to you to truly receive your love to trust you enough to receive it to not let our own evaluation of ourselves speak louder than what you've declared to be true about ourselves. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.